my mate was on the floor with two guys kicking the crap out of him. So obviously he joined in and it all spilled out outside. And at the corner of my eye, there was one sneaking up. Boom. Head kicked him. I was at Preston Prison, which is a maximum security yeah. prison. And you're sitting there waiting to be assigned to your cell. And they're coming, all right, mate, what you in for? And I'm like, fuck off. They have a TV show called The Ultimate Fighter, yeah. which is like Big Brother, yeah. 16 guys live in a house every week, two people fight, winner stays, loser goes home. Were you thinking this is my big break? I was there to win the show yeah. and start my UFC career. I, I built up to another one. I was fighting Vito Belfort, who's well known for being a massive juice head. Smashed the pieces, bl cuts everywhere, blood leaking out of my face like a maniac. Just horrible. Yeah. He said, Mike, sorry, you're never going to oh, fight again. Man. He said, your eyes destroyed, you're never going to fight. So I'm like, oh, here we fucking go. So how's your eye at the moment now? Is it, can you yeah, 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 take your eye out? Yeah. It's the new That's it. UFC middleweight champion. Mike, welcome to the show, mate. It's a pleasure to be here, mate. Thank you for having me. No worries at all. Let's roll all the way back, Mike. Where did you grow up and how did you become the first British champion to win the title with one eye? Yeah, I mean, it's a long story, but I'll give you the quick bullet points. Grew up in Clitheroe, born in Cyprus uh, on a British army base, so British soil. Uh, moved around a little bit, lived in Clitheroe. Started martial arts at eight years old. Was very, very good at that. Uh, and then teenage years, discovered what teenage boys want to get into. Do you know what I mean? And uh, forgot all about martial arts and... Found myself as a bit of a scrapper, shall we say, growing up and uh, met my wife. Now my wife had some kids and thought, right, got to get my shit together, you know. Um, You're saying near Clivero. Whereabouts is Clivero in the country? Where's it near, like the Lancashire, major city? Lancashire, the about major 40 city? minutes outside of Manchester. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, so northwest, middle of nowhere. And what was, what, was, what was it like growing up around there? Were you out scrapping from an early age? or? Oh, yeah, yeah, proper was, early age, yeah. Um, just a lot of idiots. A lot yeah. of dickheads, if I'm honest, yeah. you know. Uh, and I was probably one of them as well, though, yeah. growing up, you know. We saw a bit of argy-bargy in our house growing up. So to me, you know, getting in a fight seemed very normal and natural. So, and uh, yeah, I was, I don't know. I mean, that was like my badge of honour. Do you know what I mean? I didn't have much anything else. I didn't have many friends. I wasn't popular with the girls. We didn't have any money, you know. But uh, I was known as being a bit of a tough guy. Yeah. Uh, so that was like, you know, my whole thing. And I, it was stupid. Growing yeah. up now as a, as a mature man, looking mm. back, it was ridiculous, very immature and silly and whatnot. But, you know. That's what's made you are today. It made me who I am yeah, today, mate. yeah. My dad kicking the crap out of me every day as well. <laughs> <laughs> nice one, Dad. What was, what was your upbringing like with your mum and dad? Yeah, it was it, it was good. I mean, typical working class family. You know what I mean? It was, it was, a, it was a mental household. I don't want to say too much because I don't want to throw my mum and dad under a bus. But, yeah, it was, it was, it was a very, very... Um, Upside down, there was a shouting, screaming every day, yeah. kicking off. You know, my mum and dad at it all the time, and uh, trickled down to us. We were always getting a hiding every day, but my, they, they were great though. Yeah. You know, I mean, my dad was in the army; he was a sniper, uh, and then he come out, and then you know, there's no call for a sniper on Civvy Street, and he's working as a petrol pump attendant. Yeah, Do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? So, yeah. like, I'm sure he was going through his own issues, PTSD, and God knows what else. Which I, as a kid, you don't realise. You know, yeah, a bit of a bad temper. My mum had a bad temper. They weren't a good match for one another. They divorced. You know, and uh, yeah, just just a bit mental. But it's not. It's a pretty common story. Yeah, 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 do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It was a different time as well. Yeah. You could give your kids a kick in back. Yeah, then. back in the eighties, <laughs> couldn't you? It was all yeah. right. Do you know what I mean? No one can. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Free for all. Yeah, yeah. What's the, what was the score of you then moving on from that sort of 16, 18 year old, nineteen yeah. year old? Well, well, my wife uh, w w was a big part of that. Did uh, you meet her early doors? Did you? Yeah, yeah. I was nineteen. Uh, oh, wow. She was eighteen, and then uh, yeah, she was great. But I was still an idiot. Do you know what I mean? But um, you say idiot. Break down what you mean by idiot. I'm just going out partying, getting in okay. fights all the time. So you're going out looking for tear ups? No, I, was, I wasn't looking for tear ups. If I'm honest, all yeah. my, and, and if you see this, in my have a word. But um, all my mates were older. I was hanging around them when I was like sixteen, and I was kind of known for being like because my dad always had me in the local paper for winning martial art tournaments and whatnot. <laughs> so then when I started going up town in the pubs and whatnot, there was like some older lads that have a word and you know, oh you're a karate kid, are you? Whatever. So you know, end up getting fights. And then some of my mates, my older mates, they they weren't. I was always sorting out their problems. Let's just have it right. So you're a game. If I'm totally honest, yeah. they would start the fights. Yeah. And I'd end up finishing it for them. And I was young, I was immature, and I didn't realise it. Do you know what I mean? It's like, a lot of the time it wasn't my problems, mm. but yeah, I was game, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like my badge of honour. I was yeah. I was young, I was I was an idiot. And did you buzz from that? 
Of course I did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course I did, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you do that, you get in trouble. You know what I mean? So, uh, got sent down. It wasn't anything major, 28 days. How old uh, were you? Uh, what was that? At the time? 22, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then came out. I was like, and I remember um, <clears throat> when uh, you leave from the court, and my wife was pregnant. So what was the what was it what was it for assault? GBI, no, it was, it was, was public it? order. Okay, it was public order, but some, but I'd had a few assaults. You know what I mean? Uh, I walked into a toilet, and my mate was on the floor with two guys kicking the crap out of him. So obviously he joined in, and it all spilled out outside. And then this guy grabbed hold of a girl, and he was using her as like a human shield. And out the corner of my eye, there was one sneaking up, and I could see him. And I thought I'll wait till he gets close enough, and then boom, Ed kicked him. Ed kicked him, <laughs> and then uh, cops pulled up. Everyone ran off. I started running. And then a cop gets out of an unmarked car. He said, Michael, no point running. We saw everything. We'll just be at your house waiting for you. Right. Small town. Uh, so, yeah, that was that. I, was, that a was that a massive wake-up call for you? Did you stop after that? Yeah, well, that's what... I, I never had a fight again. Because okay. I, I I remember I was at Preston Prison, which is a maximum security yeah. prison. And I'm there, and I'm in the holding cell. You walk in, they give you a prison assigned clothes yeah. and whatnot. And you're sitting there waiting to be assigned to your cell. And there's... You know, we're talking about the dregs of society mm. in there. And they're coming, all right, man, what you in for? And I'm like, fuck off. Yeah. Don't talk to me. I'm not one of you. And I thought to myself, right then and there, right, well, I've got, you know, is this going to be my life or am I going to change? Mm. Uh, and and that was that. I came out, got a normal job, held that down. I'm my other kid. How long right? did you get? Only 28 days. 28 days, but that was enough for a wake-up call. It was a wake-up call. You know what, I ain't doing that Yeah, again. and I thank that judge because okay. at the time I was, you know, I might have told the judge to go fuck himself as well. In fact, I did. <laughs> I did, yeah. Not just that. I went on a bit of a tirade of abuse. Because I didn't do anything. My mate was getting beat up. And I was like, you, you know, whatever. I was an idiot. So you mouthed off at the judge and he only gave you 28 days? Yeah, yeah. He gave me 28 days, then I mouthed That's off. He should have given me Oh, well, but you mouthed off. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, what was I saying? Yeah, come on, I got a job. And uh, where were you? Where were you in your life at that point, though? You had a nice missus. Were you having kids on the scene? Was there no kids on the yeah, scene? Yeah, no. Well, she was pregnant when we were first. When when I in court, when I got sent oh, down, God. it was okay. shame. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's the guilt that I felt for oh, you, pathetic. Yeah. What, what what a poor excuse of a man. Yeah. Do you know? You know what I mean? And I'm out acting up with my mates. I've got a beautiful missus who's pregnant at home, and this is what I'm doing. So yeah, come out, got a job, and that was all well and good. But you skin. You yeah. know, typical working class work and uh, work your bollocks off. And then at the end of the week, you're skin. And I was like, it's got to be more to life than this. Yeah. And then. Uh, Did you stay on the straight and narrow when you were skin? Yeah. Or you were earning a pound note in all sorts of nah, ways? No, 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 no. I was never into anything. Yeah, I, okay. I, I was literally all. The only. Um, Thing I ever got in trouble for was fighting. Yeah, I was never doing anything else. Okay. I was never a thief. I was never burgling. I was never selling drugs. I was yeah. never doing anything like that. All I was doing was going out, getting pissed up, and getting in fights. Yeah, do you know, like a total dickhead. Yeah, do you know that's what I mean? An idiot. Just and getting... what year are we talking here? If you're 22, are we talking early 2000s here. Yeah, it was late mid to late 90s. Mid that's late, what, okay. From 95. Onwards. To about two thousand and one, right, okay. I had a proper good laugh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I heard. I heard. I tell me time. about tell me about DJ Mikey B. Oh yeah, in yeah, Wigan. yeah. <laughs> yeah well, well, that well, that was kind of like because um, I was all bang into martial arts. Yeah. Like, I was obsessed, obsessed with martial arts. And I was walking home. I was working at this factory. I was walking home, and I popped into my mate's house, and uh, he had a set of decks and records and everything. And I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. So I was like fuck martial arts I'm going to be a DJ <laughs> and I put everything into being a DJ and I, you know I DJ at a few places and whatnot and I had a little reputation up in the northwest. but I, I wasn't exactly setting the world yeah, on fire yeah, yeah, I wasn't yeah. making much money I was never going to be a, a bloody Carl Cox or a Judge Jules mm. or anything so uh, yeah anyway yeah there you go so where was the brainchild then where was the movements because mixed martial arts wasn't massive in the country at that nope. time right what was your thought process you, should, you must have had people going what's, what's he doing he ain't going to be able to do mixed martial arts what's he doing going to America everyone not backing you did you have that feeling no no I didn't have that feeling no not you did other people were other people feeling yeah, that yeah, you no, heard them pe talking about you people were talking about okay. me yeah yeah because I had this sensei when I was a kid Right, and I was very good at martial arts, you know, humble brag, but I won every tournament I ever entered. And on top of that, I was, I, I, I could fight. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I knew I could. I never lost a street fight in my yeah. life, and I had a lot of them, sadly. Uh, 
And this guy would always call me up when I was off in my partying days, if you will. He was always calling me up, my old sensei, saying, Michael, you know, fighting's really explode, exploding, mixed martial arts. And I was not interested. I used to ignore his calls and all the rest of it. But then when I was working at a factory and we were skint and whatnot, I thought, there's got to be more to life than this. So I tracked him down. I found an email address for him because I didn't have his number. Uh, got an email address, sent him an email. Never heard back for a few weeks. Then one Sunday night and we're watching Heartbeat. We get a phone call and... Uh, yeah, he told me all about something called the UFC. I didn't even know what it was. And uh, he said, listen, uh, he, get, he made me an offer. He said, if you quit work, move down to Nottingham, train Monday to Friday, go home and DJ so you can make a little bit of money. Yeah. Uh, if you make it to top five in the country, I'll give you lots of earnings for the job you, 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 were, you, you were working at. So I thought, all right, that sounds like a good opportunity. I knew I could do it. My wife, right then and there, when I put the phone call down, because she was listening, yeah. she said, I knew that was the night our life was going to oh, change. She, she really did. And yeah, uh, quit work, threw a, a mattress in the back of my car, drove down to Nottingham and started training to be a mixed martial artist, whatever that was. Yeah. Do you know what, what I mean? What year was this? This is 2002. Two. And then... Um, wow. I'm a first professional fight three months later because I'd done a lot of martial arts growing up. I'd, I'd been a kickboxer. I'd done a bit of boxing. I'd done a lot of... I was a black belt in Japanese jiu-jitsu. And Japanese jiu-jitsu actually does a bit of everything. Yeah. They do uh, groundwork. They do throws. They do striking. So it was a pretty good precursor yeah. to mixed martial arts, to be honest. A lot of it wasn't necessarily suitable but because my brain was formatted, because you know what I mean, because I'd mm. done a lot of martial arts, I picked it up very quick. Won my first fight three months later. Won that very quickly. I think in the first two years, I had like 10 fights. I was undefeated. I'd won every belt there was in England. I was a super heavyweight kickboxing champion. I was the light heavyweight, uh, cage race champion, cage warriors champion, FX3 champion. And then... Um, so you were making a proper name for yourself in the UK. Oh, yeah. But you knew, did you know that the pound note was... I wasn't making was in, any money. No, that's what I'm saying. But did you know the pound note was in America at that point? Oh, of course it was, yeah. Because yeah. I wasn't in the UFC. I was yeah. in this small local promotions. Some of them are very good. Like Cage Warriors is still going to this day. And Cage Rage, there were some amazing fights there. And it was massive for the development of the UK MMA scene. So a big thank you to all those promoters, you know, because they weren't necessarily making a ton mm. either. Um, but yeah, the goal was always to get to the UFC. But on that phone call... When I told you the What's guy. What's the name of the sensor, by the way? I don't want to say because no, it's okay. quick. He, 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 it's a long story. He okay. Ended, he ended up suing me. He ended You're up joking me. Yeah. For what? Yeah. And he was, he was like a child. He was like a father figure to me. He moved away. So we started training. And I was, hold on. But he said on that phone call that night, he said, Mike, you go out to America, you fight there. He said, the champions are making really big money. Yeah. He said, they're becoming celebrities. They're acting in movies and all the rest of it. And that was like the vision that he put in my head. And I've... It's all come true. Um, Fair play to him. Respect for that. Oh, no, no, no. 100%. Yeah. So I was going down there and I was, you know, training and whatnot and a lot of the time sleeping in my car and stuff. And he, after a bit, I realised it was just like his little side project. Okay. He was picking it up and putting it down. Hey, listen, he's got a family and stuff to do like that. Uh, but then he moved to New Zealand. And he wanted me to move out to New Zealand with him. I'm like, I'm not moving to New Zealand. What are you talking about? So he went off and moved to New Zealand. Yeah. And that was that. Yeah. And he never kept in touch. And this is early days, so it's not, you know, it's, the smartphones yeah. weren't about like they are now and whatnot. Uh, and that was that. I didn't hear from him ever again. And then throughout my career, I started uh, I signed with the UFC and started making some money. And then all of a sudden, no phone call, no nothing from him. Bang. I get I get issued with lawsuit papers. You're joking he was suing me. me. Yeah, For I'll... what? Did you sign anything with him? Yeah, I signed the contract with him. Saying yeah. what? Saying well, I'm, I'm with a... you. Yeah, yeah. That, that We're you're going my 50 manager. 50-50. You take 20%. Yeah, or... yeah, whatever it was. I okay. can't remember the terms of the contract. Yeah, but yeah, I signed the contract, obviously, because he was going to train me and manage me. Yeah. And he obviously wants to get his investment back. So he had but that he... piece of paper, basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But he moved to New Zealand. Wow. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Okay. So it's like, as far as I'm concerned, so I joined another team and whatnot and cracked on with my life. So he's done the off skis, but he's still got that piece of paper to say, yeah. I'm contracted to Yeah, you. yeah, yeah. And oh, so down mate. the line, years later, years later. So anyway, that's why I don't want to yeah, really okay. give, give his How long did that court case go on for? How long? Well, that one, uh, not long, because that was nothing. Was it nipped in the bud? It, yeah, I mean, I, I, had to, I think I had to give him 10 grand or oh, something. Oh, mate, have so it. Shut up, piss <laughs> off. Do Take one. 10 grand, <laughs> stick it up your fucking ass. Do you know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, anyway. When did you realise that you need to get to America? What year was it? Well, no, that, that was always the plan. Yeah. So in What two, year did you actually move there? Yeah, well, they have a TV show called The Ultimate Fighter, yeah. which is like Big Brother, 
Yep. 16 guys live in a house. Every week, two people f- uh, two people fight. Winner stays, loser goes home. And they whittle it down until there's one oh, guy wow. left. So they'd had season one on there and, and it was it was massive. That saved the UFC. The UFC was actually going to go bankrupt. Right. Uh, but by the ultimate fight being on TV in America and for people able to see that these were just normal people, family men, just trying to live their lives and make the best out of the skills, if you will, that they had, um, it became massively popular because the UFC literally was going to go out of business. There's a whole documentary about Is it. Is that before Dana? White no, no, they, this, they, after. Dana and Lorenzo and they were pumping a fortune yeah. into it to keep it afloat, yeah. but it just wasn't working okay. out. So they came up with this idea and this was their last ditch attempt. Genius. And it it changed everything. Yeah. And now it's the, the most valuable sports franchise on the planet. Yeah. But uh, so they did season one and it was on TV, on Bravo TV back in the day. And my wife wouldn't let me watch it. She said, no, no, we're not watching that. I said, why not? She said, because I know if you were on it, you'd win the whole thing. You know what I mean? Uh, so they did season one, season two. Then they did a season three. And they wanted two Englishmen. Oh. So they came out and held open auditions at Earl's Court 2004. Yeah. And uh, when when we showed up, everyone in the light heavyweight division, I'd knocked them all out. <laughs> <laughs> and none of them had any personality either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they wanted personalities, but they wanted good fighters. So it was kind of a no-brainer. Went out to America. I'm on a reality TV show, locked in a house 24-7. It was brilliant. I loved it. I loved it. How long it? for? Uh, what was it? Six, seven weeks. Was it? Okay. Yeah. No, no phones. No contact with the outside world. No nothing. Just... Were you thinking this is my big break? Oh, of course. Yeah. I was there to win the show yeah. and start my UFC career. Some people were there to get the fifteen minutes of fame yeah. or whatever, and just act jack the lad, you know. So yeah, went out there, won the whole thing, became the Ultimate Fighter season three champ, and contracting the UFC, and off we went. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable yeah, story. Good. So what happened at that point and then you won it? Was that with Dana White said, right, you're now contracted to the UFC. <laughs> are they, did, did, does it someone like Dana White own you to put you in fights or are you yourself but you're getting paid pay-per-view? How does it work? How's yeah, the yeah, yeah. Model no, work? No, so, so your contract was um, self, what do you call it? Self-contracted? Self-employed. No? Self-employed, yep. yeah. Uh, self-employed. Uh, we have a contract to fight with the UFC. Exclusively okay. we fight with the UFC. Yeah. Uh, they don't own you. They, yeah. they can't force you to fight or whatever. But they they'll, lay, lo- they'll, they'll lay some fights on the table and say, do you want that? Yeah. The, the, the offer's a, that. And it's up to you. Yeah. It, it, it's the offer, it's the opponent, it's the location and date. Uh, up to you. If you don't want to take it, you don't want to take it. Uh, but obviously I was accepted every Hungry. single one. <laughs> yeah. I, I was, do you remember how you got paid on your first UFC fight? Yeah, well, on the ultimate fight, it wasn't much. Uh, Roughly, what, how much? What, uh, it was 10 grand. I got. Okay. Five and five. But it, that was just a reality TV show. Yeah. Do you know but what I mean? But at that time, were you thinking, happy day, I've got 10 grand for fighting. For I got I 10 grand and I got a little bit of sponsorship. I went home, I was, I was happy as Larry. <laughs> uh, and, the, the, and then my UFC debut, I was at the MGM Grand, UFC 66. This team I was with, they never showed up, these bunch of scousers. They, they, they were robbing bastards. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. Um, I flew out to Vegas by myself at the MGM Grand. No one showed up, no team, no cornerman, no nothing. Stayed in Vegas by myself. Uh, I had Christmas because it was on, the day before New Year's Eve, the fight was. So I went out two weeks before. I had Christmas Day dinner by myself at this palace station. It's a shit up. <laughs> Lorenzo, who used to own the UFC, owns the hotel. <laughs> but it is. Uh, I, I had Christmas dinner by myself at the palace station buffet. It was fucking miserable. <laughs> miserable. But I wasn't there for that. I was there to fight. Went out. Got my first uh, first round knockout. Got my paycheck, which was about 50-something. And then Dana gave me a bonus of 100 grand. You're and joking, a little bit of, A little bit of sponsorship. Dollars, under grand dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went from... Working, at, what was it? Three pound eighty an hour. Yeah, in the factory. Yeah. And then, and then I looked round, and I had about two hundred grand. I had checks for about two hundred grand, and I couldn't believe it. And Rebecca, my wife, she flew out, and she was in, way up in the nosebleeds in the stands by herself. And Dana came back and gave me this, uh, th- these checks, gave me these bonuses and whatnot, and I couldn't believe it. And because she'd always had so much faith in me, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. And she put her hopes and dreams on hold to support me fucking first thing I did was sprint out I was looking for her and she was way up in the stands I run up and I'm like here look look at this I told you babe I told you Amazing. and that, that was that that was the one, first of what did I have 29, 30 fights in the UFC yeah. what a lovely story Rebecca fair play to your wife man backing you fully 100% to the top I wouldn't be here if it yeah agree I'm the same 
Absolutely, mate. What was the score then when you, you had that fight? Did you say to Rebecca, right, we've got to move out to America to make this work? No, 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 far from it. I stayed in the UK for, for, for quite a lot. In fact, it was I didn't move to the U, US for about another six years. Okay. Um, I left that other manager and there was, well, he moved away. But the, uh, the sensei one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there was a gym opened in Liverpool. Uh, state of the art, they had the good training partners and all the rest of it. And I moved, uh, started training there. I signed a five-year deal and uh don't want to go into too much because they love a good lawsuit, this lot. Yeah. Uh, I ended up in a lawsuit for 10 years with them, which sounds like a theme, but there's a lot of sharks, yeah. do you know what I mean, in the fight game, do yeah. you know what I mean? So I did my five years, but there was sponsorship money not being paid. There was all kinds of stuff going on and they didn't exactly fly straight, shall yeah. we say, and we're talking on a major level, yeah. do you know what I mean? Uh, so I kept my mouth shut. You but, had to uh, keep your mouth shut. Well, Well, you know the stuff they were up yeah. to I'm not going to fucking yeah. go around talking about it yeah. Uh, but then yeah I was like you know it wasn't good it wasn't good there was money going missing I was I was, basically they were taking the piss I was getting yeah. robbed blind sponsorship money was going missing they were just saying no sponsors haven't paid I'd reach out to the sponsors directly they'd show me bank transfers and no mate it's been paid yeah. it was paid a few days after you fight just a lot of yeah. stuff like that do you know what I mean but they were a heavy firm yeah. do you know what I mean so uh, I uh when my, my, when my contract was mm. up, I was like, well, I need a team. I left them and I had a lot of connections in America because I've been going out there doing some training camps here. So what there. rough year are we talking here now? This then? is 2011. 11, okay. 2011 and I had a good mate that said, listen, come and stay here, bring the whole family. Yeah. I had the work visa. You know, listen, life's for living. Yeah. Life's for living and there's a big world out there. I had the work visa. The sport is massive out there as mm. well. Excuse me, way bigger than here. More training partners, more opportunities, more chance to make money with sponsors and all the rest of it and TV work and film and all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, we, we went out there in 2011. Uh, plan wasn't to be there all this time. It was just to go out there whilst I was fighting. Mm. Uh, and, yeah, that was 12 years ago. Yeah. And tell me about the journey from 11 then. We brought the whole family out. What's, yep. it, but what's it like living out in the US for you? Um it's good. Yeah. yeah, I love it. I mean, it's 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 very different. You know, don't get me wrong. We have a lovely life, and I love it. We have a great house. Weather's amazing. Yeah. Lots of opportunity. The UFC is huge there, so you know, I'm now I'm now compensating the sport and doing a lot of stuff like that. Um, but you miss friends and family. Yeah. You miss the sense of humour. The four seasons. The four. Well, <laughs> well, well. Yeah, for, for two for seasons. Two of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> two seasons and, and yeah. a week of summer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's not. I, I do miss England massively. I'm mm. so happy every time I get a chance to come back. Yeah. But, but you, you've only got one shot at life. You yeah. know what I mean? And th th that just made sense for me at the time. A lot of fighters, because people always say, do you have to go out to America to make it? No, you don't. Yeah, not okay. at all. But my situation at the time, you know, I didn't have a team. I had a fight coming up. I didn't yeah. have anyone to train with. I had a lot of contacts out there. And at the time, the, the sport was still nowhere near what it is today. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. There was there, there there wasn't many places to train, so I had to do what I had to do. What was your relationship like with Dana White today? What's your relationship brilliant. been like over the last 10, 12 years? Brilliant. He's yeah. he's amazing. Good People, bloke. Brilliant bloke. Yeah. Brilliant. And 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 I'll defend him to the day I die. People love to talk shit. People love to get on the high horse and talk about oh the UFC don't get paid enough and all the rest of it and boxers get low, loads more. That's nonsense. Yeah. That that's a narrative that is totally bullshit. Um because you look, there's a few outliers in boxing that are getting mega yeah. dull. Do you know what I mean? But most most boxers but they lay it aren't. down, don't yeah, fucking agree. right. Yeah, you know agree. what I mean? You look on Floyd Mayweather's undercards. There's people getting 150 bucks. Yeah. Entry level fighters in the UFC are getting 20 grand, right? Yeah. Which which you know isn't huge, but you're an entry level fighter in mm. boxing. You're gonna get whatever. Uh, yeah, there's Tyson Furies, but they got Conor McGregor's. But anyway, we're not talking about that. Mm. Um, listen, um, he has been a really good friend to me over the years. When I had that lawsuit, he came and gave evidence. Yeah. He has helped me out. He's been a good friend. Um, as he had to call me up sometimes and say, what are you doing, you <laughs> dickhead? Yeah, he has. And fair enough, and yeah. I probably deserved it. But he's, he's, he's very, very loyal. He's never let me down. If he said something, he's always followed through with it. And I see the way he treats people and what he does for people mm. and how he, how he helps people. You know, like, uh, look, look, when my youngest was born, Lucas, um, we were at, I was we were living back up in Lancashire still, 
and uh, we went out, we come back and there was a little note to open your garage and we opened the garage and from floor to ceiling it was just full of like, old baby stuff and like no, Gucci it. tote bags and prams yeah. and all the rest of it, you, you, you know, so... Uh, yeah, no, he, he's sounds awesome. Like a fella. He's yep. great, man. He's yeah. great, and that just sounds like I'm just being bought with fucking prams. No, but it's the thought. thought. It's the yeah, thought because he doesn't have to think about that. Yeah. He's like, oh, they're having a baby. Yeah. Send them, you know. Yeah. Probably got his assistant to do it, whatever. Yeah. But who cares? But he's still thought of you. He's yeah, juggling man. everyone no, 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 else. No. Yeah, amazing. I, he's he's been a good friend. Yeah, he really has. And tell me your journey then to the, up to the 2014 when you got your eye bashed up. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I was fighting. I was doing very well. Um, I got myself to number one contender matchups where if I won it, I was fighting for the belt several times and then, you know, lost those fights. A couple of bullshit decisions, whatever, but, the, you know, and then I built up to another one. I was fighting Vito Belfort, who's yeah. well known for being a massive juice head. Yeah. And he was fighting down in Brazil specifically. Did everyone know he's on the boards? Oh, of course, yeah. everyone. You take one look at him, it's yeah. clearly obvious. Yeah. But on top of that, he was also a ridiculously good fighter. You yeah. know, he beautiful boxing big power fast hands ridiculous kicks amazing jiu-jitsu you know he's he's, he's legit mm. you know he's like a legendary fighter mm. but juiced out of his mind and he was fighting specifically just in brazil because there was no testing down there yeah. and he was knocking everyone out like crazy uh, and he said to me go down to brazil you beat vito belfort you'll get a title shot and i've thought to myself he's on well i knew he was on steroids but i thought you know arrogance of youth you yeah. think I can still beat this guy so I went down there got kicked in the head I went down he followed it up they stopped the fight so he beat me um, and then a few weeks later started having issues with my eye you know and then eventually I couldn't see my hand in front of my eye so went to a doctor detached retina then it re-detached then I had glau glaucoma. So I just had a what, lot glaucoma? of... Glaucoma, what's that? Glaucoma, so, so it detached, it re-detached. So that was... The, the surgery is mental, the, what, what they do yeah. to you. It's crazy. And then I, I'll, I'll give you this story real quick. One day I'm out walking the dog. I was told after the second surgery, don't do anything uh, strenuous because if you get your heart rate up, it can mess with the eye yeah. in the recovery. So we're having a gentle stroll with the dog, me and my wife and the baby. And I started getting a headache. And then by the time I get home, my head is exploding. And I mean bad, mm. with the worst pain you've ever felt. And I'm led face down on the floor because it was like the best kind of relief. And my head literally felt like it was going to pop. It was like, it was insane. So she called my eye doctor and uh, he said, listen, I'm just going in surgery. He said, but go down to uh, Garden Grove, this town near us. There's a doctor there, he'll be waiting for you. So we drive down, they look at the eye, they said, right, you've got glaucoma. And he said, what it is, if you touch your eye, it's wet, right? Mm. So there's water going into mm. your eye all the time and there's a drain. So obviously there's a mm. constant supply of fresh liquids, not water, but you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Uh, glaucoma is, the drain is blocked. So if you imagine a, ta uh, a balloon on the end of a tap filling with water, it's filling with water, what's going to happen eventually? Mm. It's mm. going to pop, mm. you know, and that's what's going on with the eye. So they tested my eye pressure and a normal person's eye pressure is between nine and 20. Mine was in the 80s. He said, we've never seen it as high. So they, they did a little bit of treatment. Uh, then they sent me off to another hospital. They said, go there. They said, they can uh, shoot a laser into your, your eye and hopefully it'll clear the drain. I went there. They did the laser stuff. They gave me some medication, which made me all groggy. I went home. Now it's like four in the morning and I'm still howling. In a, you don't understand. In the, full on pain. Full on. You yeah. don't understand. Yeah. Ah, ah, just, just, just. Just horrible, yeah. horrible. So um, my wife didn't know what to do, but we had the doctor's, my surgeon's cell phone, mobile number, uh, been in America too long. <laughs> she calls him in the middle of the night. Sorry to wake you up, but he's still howling in agony. He's like, oh my God, he's still in pain. He needs emergency surgery right now. So we had to leave the kids all in bed because it's like four in the morning, lock the door and just hope for the best. We drive up to Pasadena. There's a doctor waiting for me and his nurse. I'm effing and jeffing, swearing my head off. I'm just like in so much pain. He says, right, stay there. Gets a big needle out, right into my eyeball. That was anesthetic. I was like, oh, oh my God, thank you. I said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry because I was a yeah. right cunt. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> And the doctor was like, it's fine. The nurse weren't having it, yeah. though. She was not having it. Uh, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Anyway, so he explains. Uh, the, he says, right, I need to put this drain in. And he pulls out this plastic drain about this big. He says, we'll put that in the corner of your eye, and then you'll have, you know, the issue will go. And I said, well, I can't do that because I need to fight. 
He said, well, Michael, never mind that. He said, you need this in. I said, well, if I can't fight, I'm not having it. And he said, well, as it happens, he said, a very famous heavyweight boxer that shall remain nameless, that was what he said, I did it to him and he still went on and fought. I said, all right, l let's do it then. Yeah. So I, I lie down, well, I said, lie down. I go to a hospital, I get checked in, I go for surgery, I'm laid in the bed, I'm all mm. taped up so I don't move. I go under with anaesthetic and then I come round on the hospital bed. I'm all strapped up like a mental patient. And then uh, I'm like, Ugh, coming round. <laughs> and they're like, the doctor's a little startled. Like, oh, hold on, Michael. He said, you've just, the anaesthetic's worn off. You've just come round a little bit early. We're almost done though. Stay still. And then shoo, another big needle comes into my eye. And they went, right, we're kind of done. And I let down, I just start going. <laughs> and I'm just thrashing about the, the pain because before it was like the most craziest dull ache but now it was sharp it was like a knife going into me and I'm screaming oh. and the doctor's like what's going on I said ah the pain the pain they're like what like before I was like no worse than before another needle into my eye I go back unconscious um, and then I come round I'm in a hospital bed I open my eyes I'm like yeah, man. What's, What's going on? Yeah. It's all nice and peaceful yeah. and whatnot. Uh, long story short, what happened was they put the drain in, but they messed it up. So the the coloured part of your your eye, the uh, the iris, is like a gel disc, mm. and they put the drain in the wrong place. It was kind of sucking the iris okay. into the drain. So they had to undo the surgery, redo it all, and whatnot. And then when I came round after that, um, I never saw again. But I don't think it was just because of the botched surgery. It's because the pressure was so high. Yeah. All the nerve endings have been killed. and So, yeah, from there, I never fought again. And I remember the What next... year was this? Um, um, 2013. 13, okay. And then... Um... Did Dana White call you at all and say, mate, you cannot carry on fighting or you can carry on fighting? Yeah, you... yeah, yeah. No, I came out of the hospital and was driving home. And I get a phone call of Dana. He said, have you spoke to your doctor? I said, no, I haven't. And he says, um, well, I have. I said, yeah, what did he say? He said, Mike, sorry, you're never going to oh, fight again. Man. He said, your eyes destroyed, you're never going to fight. And uh, that was a hard phone call to take. Um, but I went off to see the, the eye doctor to get treatment, you know, post-operation yeah. follow-ups and all the rest of it. And yeah. I was like, will this ever get better? You know, will it ever improve? And I think the doctor was just trying to give me a glimmer of hope. Mm. He's like, well, you know, we have seen it in a few rare cases where it has improved. Now, to get cleared to fight, your vision's got to be 2200 which is still clinically blind. So if you look at an eye chart, the big massive letter yeah, at the top yeah, yeah. and then the two bigger ones below it, that's all you've got to be able to read, okay? So it's pretty easy. And they're they, they testing you for that? They take, well, you get an eye test once a year yeah. and then you get an eye test every time, a doctor checks your eyes every time you fight. Right, okay. Right? Um, so I'm like, well, 2200, you know, maybe if it improves a bit, I might be able to see that because I could still... Well, well I, I'm lying. I couldn't see fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, um, hope. Yeah, yeah. But the doctor said it can improve. Yeah. So I would drive an hour and a half to this town called, what was it called? Pomona every week. And I'd sit there with all the old ladies and, and fellas, you know, because they're all getting cataracts yeah. and whatnot. They're all like in the 90s and I'm sitting there in the prime of my life. Week after week after week after week. And I go up one week and my doctor isn't there. It's a different doctor. He was just filling in. Mm. And he says to me, he says, I'm just looking at your chart here, Michael. He says, you come up here every week. Every week. I said, yeah, I do. He said, why? I said, I've got a fight, though. Yeah. I've got a fight. I said, That's, I've got a lawsuit going on. We've just moved to America. Yeah. We've bought this big stupid house that I don't need. I said, this is all I know. I have to fight. And uh, he's on his chair and he rolls his feet over, he rolls over on his chair and he says, my dad told me that there's two types of men in the jungle. One man swings through the jungle on a vine and he waits until he has hold of another one before he lets go. He said, the other man swings through the jungle on a vine and he lets go. Mm. And he hopes that he catches another mm. one. He said, something tells me you're that second type of man, Michael. I said, I am, dog. Mm. I am. He said, all right. Because I was told not to work out, not to do anything, whatever. He said, we'll start training again. And I was like, well, you are. Happy day. So he the says, doctors just give you their heads up on that. He said, start training again. I said, uh, well, and we'll see what happens. So, uh, and we'll leave that there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to be throwing anyone on the bus. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, but then I was cheating on tests going forward. I remember, so so I started training. I said to the UFC, I said, yeah, 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 I, I can fight again. And I was doing some media here in England, in London. And uh, they were like, right, well, we want, we want to get your eyes tested. So I'm like, for fuck's sake. You know, so I, I go and I have to do this test where you look in this machine, this big massive circle, and it's all white, 
and every now and again a little like yeah, a little, little dash of light yeah. pops up and when you see that you have two joysticks in your hand and you just push the button push the button well I can see the left side but the right side I can't see yeah. anything right and I've looked at the pattern on the lefts right like the kind of the time I'm just guessing yeah. I'm just guessing on the right side I fucking passed <laughs> I fucking Quality. passed right and I was, it was total blagging it Right, so I'm like, let's go. I come out, and then I get a phone call from the UFC. No, 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 that was the wrong type of test. Yeah. You got to go to a different one. I'm like, oh, for crying out loud, I have just blagged that <laughs> yeah. one. Anyway, so I go to see this eye doctor, and it was this lovely old Indian doctor, very, very sweet guy. And in the, his office, there was like this um, old World War Two war veteran mm. in his late nineties. You know what I mean? Like a very eccentric old man, and he was a lovely fella. And we were talking. You know, those that generation always dressed up to the nines, mm. aren't they? Had the mm. the suit on, the tie, and the hat, and everything. You know, so we were all being very respectful. And he's talking to us about the war and stuff. Yeah. And the doctor's like, "I'm just going to walk Mister Such and Such out to his car. You go in my office and make yourself comfortable, right?" So I'm like, oh, here we fucking go. So I go in the office and the eye test is just an old fashioned mm. eye test. Like I said, top letter, yeah. two two letters below mm. it. That's all I've got to know. Mm. And it was like a triangle. So you spun, there was like three different tests. So I'm like, right, C, D, E, spin it round, L, M, N, spin it round. So I just remembered mm. all, the, all the three combinations. Mm. Well, the doctor doesn't know that I'm trying to blag a test. Mm. Doctor thinks I'm literally checking on my eyes. So he comes in and he covers up my bad eye first and says, read what you can, do the whole thing, smash it, you know. He says, right, covers up the other eye, doesn't move it round. Mm. So I've memorised it anyway. So I'm like, C, D, E. Mm. Ooh, oh, it gets a bit blurry after that, Doc, sadly. But I knew that was the benchmark. Mm. And he goes, right, he says, um, he says, you've passed. He says, I'm going to sign this and you'll be licensed to fight. Oh, he said, but don't fight, Michael. He said, you can't fight. He said, if anything happens to your good eye, you're going to go blind. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. I'll give it some thought. Yeah. Oh, yeah, thanks, Doc. Yeah. Walk out. <laughs> Fucking come on. I was like, shut up, you dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Did you, had you earned enough money before that happened no. to survive? No. 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 So the pressure was on on the family, yourself. Oh, big time. Okay. My, my, my biggest earners were all after okay, my yeah. eye injury. Do you know what I mean? How, what's that feeling like you're going for a world title fight and you're, you're going to go, if I win this, I'm going to get world title and you just miss it at the last hurdle and miss it at the last yeah. hurdle. And after that fight there, you come back and you fought Anderson Silva. Yep. Tell me about that fight in London. What was the atmosphere like at the O2? Oh, it, it, it was just unbelievable. But just, just, just to touch on what yeah. you said there, I fought this guy, Luke Rocco, which is who I fought for the belt, but this was in Sydney, Australia. Yeah. And I've been in number one contender fights a few times and this reporter said to me, he said, well, this is it, right, Michael? This is the end of the road. He said, you lose this one, he said, you're pretty much done, right? Yeah, you might have some fights, but you're never going to sniff a belt again. And I said, no, no. What are you talking about? Mm. I said, if I lose this fight, I'll be gutted, but I ain't going to give up. Yeah. I ain't going to stop as long as I can still do this, as long as my heart's still beating mm. and I'm fit. So I ain't going to give up. So you might do that. This might be the end of uh, the road for you. I said, but I'm built different, mate. Yeah. If, I, if I lose this, we crack on. Anyway, went on a four-fight winning streak. Uh, for Anderson Silver at the O2. That was one of my biggest best fondest memories it was just unbelievable because I was a massive fan of Anderson yeah. he's my favourite fighter he's, he was an incredible is he the greatest of all time for you he's one of okay. him George St. Pierre they're probably oh John Jones yeah and yeah yeah you know it, the fight was going great won the first round dropped him in the second round third round I was cruising then my mouthpiece came out my gum shield and I've only got one eye so and he's known for his knees and whatnot yeah. and I don't want to get my teeth smashed out yeah. uh so he's in front of me there. My mouthpiece gets knocked out, gum shield. And so he's there. Referee's over there. So I turn and I go, ref, my gum shield, right? But say Anderson's my hand. If I turn there, I can't see Anderson. Yeah. You know what I mean? So then when I look round back, he's in midair, boom, flying knees me. And as the round ends, beep, the horn goes, I hit the deck, right? So the referee dives in. It's the end of the round, but with the madness and the crowd, they were so loud. Um, Anderson thinks he's won the fight. Yeah. He was so, off celebrating, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, so he jumps yeah, on yeah. top of the ring and all the rest of it. I'm on the floor and everyone, like all the Americans or any Anderson Silver fans, like, yeah, you were knocked out, right? So the fight should have been over. I'm like, what do you mean? I was talking to the referee. I'm on the floor, I'm covered in blood and I look up at the ref, I'm like, I'm not out, ref. And he goes, I know, <laughs> fight's still on. Yeah. And they just had to tell Anderson and then I was 
smashed to pieces, bl- cuts everywhere, blood leaking out of my face like a maniac. But uh, went off, won round four. Round five was a bit of a bit of a bit of a tough one, but I uh, yeah won the fight three rounds to two. Amazing, what an amazing! Do you remember how much you got paid for that fight? Um, you're a nosy bastard. <laughs> <laughs> roughly, roughly. Yeah, yeah. yeah just, but so the, just so the listeners out there understand. Half a, wow. Yeah, about half a mil. Was that a game changer for you financially in your world at that point? Yeah, well, well, I was on a contract, so I was getting close to that per yeah. fight. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, as I say, towards the end of my career, that they, they were my best contracts. And then I fought uh, Rock, Rockhold. I became the champ. And then I fought George St. Pierre. It was a massive pay-per-view draw at Madison Square Garden. Uh, I lost that fight. I lost my belt, but it would have happened at some point. And yeah. to do it in Madison Square Garden against a legend like George St. Pierre, um, you know, I'm proud to have shared the octagon. And that, in terms of, you know, financially, that was by far my biggest fight. Right. That was about, I don't know, 2.7 million. So You're joking, like mate. That. Yeah, yeah. So that, that, was, that, that, that was a good night at the office. Mate, happy yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. So that was a complete game changer for you then. Oh, yeah. What did that, what, what happened to your career after that George fight? Yeah, so... Because my wife always said, because when I finally got a title fight, my wife said, right, after this, you're going to retire, right? I said, babe, you're out of your mind, though. If I win the belt... I'm at it again. I yeah. said, if I win the belt, I said, I'll do, try and defend it three times. I said, but when I lose it, that's when I'll call it a day. Because yeah. I'd pushed it far enough. I was 37 now. I was having knee, knee problems. Like, right now, I've got two knee, two knee replacements. Yeah. I said, when I lose, I'll retire. So I lost to George, and I never retired, but that was I was thinking about it, yeah. you know? And uh, um, it's a couple of days after the fight. I'm still black and blue, you know. And I'm in the car, and Anderson Silva was supposed to fight in Shanghai, China, in uh, in 10 days. Excuse me. And um, he tested positive for steroids. So he'd been pulled from the fight, and they were looking for a replacement. Yeah. And I'm in the car, driving with my wife and her mum and dad, the in-laws, and we're just going to go out for lunch. And it comes on the radio and says that. And I'm still black and blue and sore from the fight a few days ago. I'm like... I'm going to call the UFC. I'll take that. They went, what are you talking about? You can't do that. I said, what do you mean? I'm in shape. I just fought. Yeah, whatever. I've got a few bruises and whatnot, but I got choked out, you see, so I didn't get knocked out. Yeah. So there's no suspension because mm. when you come around from a choke, you're fine. Mm. Um, I said, and they were like, you're out of your mind. So I called Dana right then and there. I said, Dana, you're looking for someone for China, right? He says, yeah. I said, I'll do it. He's like, are you fucking serious? <laughs> I said, yeah, mate. You know, uh, flew out to China. For Kelvin Gastelum. Did you say to him, make me an offer? No, or, no, no. Or, or, will, I, he, or will he say, I, that's I, how much you get in? I, I had a contract and I said, I won't pay in what I got for the last fight. Yeah. Not the pay-per-view points. Not the 2.7, but give me half a bar. No, no, off. no. I got, I got more than that. Yeah. I got more than that. But um, it was, uh, I, I, what was it? 7.50. 7.50. I said, give me that and I'll go do it. Uh, yeah, it's another 750. Mate, I'm, massive I'm, respect, by the way. <laughs> getting all this dope. No, because I'm, like, I'm like, I'm going to retire. Amazing. I'm like, the people are like, why'd you take that fight? Well, I had 750,000 fucking reasons. <laughs> you know what I mean? Plus, you know, sponsorship and endorsements yeah. and other stuff. So, you know what I mean? So I flew out to China. I had no business. What year are we talking here with the China? This is 2017. 17, okay. I had no business taking this fight because I, I was overtrained. I was skinny as hell. I was, I was, I'd just been beat up. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Uh, but again, arrogance. I thought I could beat this guy. Went out first round, got clipped, got knocked out. Um, you know, it happens, whatever. We go off afterwards. We're at, we're at this after party with this big, massive nightclub in Shanghai. There's like a big shark in a fish tank in the middle of the dance floor. It's a fancy gaff. <laughs> and we're sitting there, we're all having drinks and whatnot. And I, I look round to the side. And when I look back this way, psh, I get a flash of light. I'm like, well, that was a bit weird. So I look look, left again, flash of light. And every time I do it, I'm getting a flash of light. And because of my history with my other eye, I know the signs of eye issues. Yeah. And I just can't believe this. I'm like, my fucking doctor warned me over and over again not to fight. He said, because you got something happens to your good eye, you're going to go blind. And I was always like, lightning ain't going to strike twice. It happened once. It's never going to happen twice. Do you know what I mean? So I was arrogant, you know? Uh, and I thought, here we are. I don't believe this. And I'm sitting in this nightclub and I'm thinking, I'm going to go fucking blind. I'm not going to see my kids grow up, you know? And everyone always said, Michael, what are you doing? You know, if you ever went blind, you'll give all the money you've earned to get your vision back yeah. and all the rest of it. And of course you would. And I'm sitting there 
in this nightclub and I'm, I'm starting to well up I'm starting to cry and I'm like I've got to get out of here because if anyone sees me crying they're going to be like oh he's crying because he lost the fight yeah. I fucking can't give a fuck about yeah. that it's yeah. like you know what I mean it's a fight you know you know, you win some you lose some you know what I mean so I bail out the club I said I'm just going to go to the toilet lads to my coach so I'm going to go to the toilet I bail out I jump in a taxi just make it before I start blubbering like a fucking baby um, I go back to my room and I'm all upset and then my coach and Daz, my mate, Daz, one of my coaches, they show up, knock on the door, and, you know, and they come in and, you know, they try to make me feel better. So I oh, fuck it, come on, just carry on drinking. Yeah. We have a mental night out in Shanghai. <laughs> Can't remember anything. 6 a.m. finish. Oh, mate, I came two on an aeroplane. <laughs> I, came, I came two on the flight back to uh, fly back to L.A. Yeah. And I'm, I'm in business class, I'm let out on the bed. I wake up, I'm like, oh, fucking hell. Oof, that was a bit of a mad one, wasn't it? <laughs> and I, I wake up and I'm sitting there, oh, yawning on the plane. I look to the left, I come back here, psh, flash a light. I forgot all about it. Do you know what I mean? Because we just like fucking. Yeah. And I'm panicking like crazy on the plane. I'm like trying to get on the Wi Fi because I want to Google what it is and all the rest of it. And the Wi Fi was down. Anyway, I land, call my eye doctor, went and saw him. And uh, it wasn't a detached retina. It was a vitreous detachment. So it's nowhere near as serious. Uh, so your eye, there's what's called vitreous fluid and there's millions and millions of fibers which attach to the back of the retina. I'm probably getting this wrong. And as you get older, through, throughout old age, um, it detaches anyway. Mm. But those like little flashes, that's a yeah. fiber uh, pulling. Yeah. And that can cause your retina to rip. Do you know what I mean? So Jeez. I was like, right, well, I need to retire. But like a total knobhead, I wasn't going to because I thought I'll have one more fight in London because the UK fans were always so brilliant yeah. to me. Do you know? And I'll never You're forget it. Over here, aren't you? Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, any US to be fair. And and yeah. I, I thought I'll, I'll have you romance it in your head. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You're like, how old were you at this time? What am I? Thirty eight. Okay. Thirty eight, thirty nine. Yeah. And I'm like, I'll have one last fight because I, I wanna, I wanna do it for them yeah. for supporting me the whole way. And you know, you romance it in your head. I'm gonna put my gloves down in the octagon. We're gonna have this farewell, and then you know, it's gonna be the perfect way to round out my career yeah. after just beat someone else. You, do you know yeah. what I mean? And then my manager was like, Mike, what the fuck are you doing? What are you doing? He said, if you, and he said, if you go blind, you're not gonna give a yeah. shit. I'm like, mate, it's one more payday. Yeah. I do this for the fucking money. I do it for my family. Yeah. It's one more payday. And he's, and he's, so anyway, I thought, you're right. You're right. So that was that. That was it. Wow. Hung up the gloves. Amazing, mate. What a story. What are your thoughts on uh, Tyson Fury versus Engano? I mean, as if you're looking at it from a boxing fan's perspective, it's a little frustrating yep. because obviously everyone wants to see him fight Usyk. Right? That's the fight that needs to happen. But... They're grown men and they can do whatever they want. So Fury's going to fight Engano. They're both going to make a shit ton of money. Fair play to them. Engano's going to get battered. You know what I mean? Uh, because he, that's no disrespect to Engano. Engano's incredible. As a UFC fighter, he was very good. Yeah. But he can't box with yeah. Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury is a phenomenal boxer. He's six foot nine. He's fast. He's faint. His technique. Everything's brilliant. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Engano's never boxed. Mm. He can crack. Don't get me wrong. You know, but there's a difference between yeah. have, packing a punch. But you never know, because he mm. might just catch him, and that's what kind of makes him interesting. You never. I reckon if I was coaching him, I'd say, listen, in the first round, rounds one, two, three, just try and get an hold of him, yeah. clinch, force him into a corner, and then from there, just unload like a madman. Mm. And you never know, you might catch mm. him. And he'll gas doing that, and then and then probably get done in. But it's probably going to... If he tries to have a technical boxing fight He's with him, have, yeah. he'll just get picked apart. Yeah, 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 yeah. What about what about you moving forwards? What how's your eye at the moment now? Is it can you yeah, 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 take look, your eye out? Yeah. So oh, Jesus. I, I, I got I got this because if you look at the eye, wow. You can see it's a mess. Wow. Like a proper mess. Um, so can you see me if you did that, can you see me at this eye? No, 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 no. I can't see Jack Shit. Nothing. The whatsoever. only thing I can see there we go, I'll give you guys a little look. The only thing I can see if I have this closed, if you turn the lights on and off, yeah. the shade of black yeah. changes. It goes from, if it's dark and you turn the lights on, it just, doom, my go grey. Yeah. You know what I mean? Hold on, one second. <laughs> Excuse me. Hold on. There we go. Oh, my God. This thing changed my life. Yeah. Because I, I didn't get this till 2018 or 19. Mm. And I was, you know, I do a bit of acting, I do TV work, I do commentary for the UFC, and 
I do other other stuff as well. I'm very lucky, you know. I've been, you know, very lucky. Um, How has your world taken off since retiring? It's taken off massively, massively, hugely. But but, but I was doing all this like entertainment yeah. work, if you will. But I'm going in for auditions. I'm showing up, and I've got an eye like that. You know, I was able to still land some roles and mm. whatnot. But most of the time, they're not looking for someone with a spazzy eye. Spaz- do you, do you, do you, they're not looking for a wonky-eyed dickhead. Do you know what I mean? Um, Who's and, the biggest puncher? Oh, hold on. And I'm yeah. so self-conscious. Yeah. And people are mean. You know, and people yeah. are dickheads on social media and all the what, rest of it. People taking the piss on all the time. That's okay. all I ever got. You know what okay. I mean? And pe- in, in real life, you know, in day to day, not just online and stuff. Do you know, and it, it bothered me. Yeah. It did. But it, but you got it. How does it bother you if you're seeing people online saying? Well, no, it doesn't bother me now. Okay. Doesn't bother me now. But it was like man, it makes you self-conscious. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because you know, it's, it does it doesn't look good. Yeah. You know. So then I found out about these things. Best three and a half grand I ever spent. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And now you can't even tell. Look at it now, yeah. it's normal. I can go in for auditions when I'm doing TV work and stuff like that. You know, it, it looks it looks fine. Yeah. And it's helping me get more mm. work. So you've built an unbelievable personal brand, right? Your brand's amazing. Everything you're doing, everything you're touching is going to gold. Let's just roll back a little bit. Who is the biggest puncher you've ever fought against? Biggest puncher, probably Dan Henderson. So I fought him at UFC 100 in Vegas. He knocked me out cold. Yeah. And then when I was unconscious, he jumped up in the air, flew through the air, and boom, oh, landed yeah. like an elbow smash on me whilst I was already unconscious. And then I rematched him uh, in a title defence when I won the belt. I fought him in Manchester. And in round one, the whole the whole game plan was avoid the right hand because he's a monster. They call it the H-bomb. Yeah. And uh, he cracks me in round one. I go down shatters my orbital on my good eye uh, and then round two catches me again as well and drops me again but I picked other than those two shots I picked him apart and battered him for yeah. the most part but he's made a career out of that right hand you know but yeah Dan Henderson Dan Henderson and what's your relationship like with Conor McGregor we don't have one we don't. Don't, we don't have one yeah yeah um is my mum re- always said, if you haven't got good things to say, say nothing at all. No, we used to have one. We used to have one. Uh, but, yeah, we'll, we'll leave that there. Why do you think that hasn't sort of blossomed? I, I know Two exactly English, why. The Irish but, but, and the English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to get into no, okay. it. There's a lot of politics yeah, there. Okay, okay. Yeah. And what's your movement been like since you retired? Obviously, we've got the UFC UK. Yep. Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm busy as hell these days, which is, I'm very lucky because... As fighters, you're all, you're always worried. What are you going to do afterwards? Because yeah. it's a tale as old as time, as old as combat sports themselves. You fight, like I said about my old man being in the army. It's mm. the same thing. You go out and when you're done, you just get cast aside. And a lot of fighters, it's the same thing, you know. So I was always terrified. What am I going to do afterwards? How am I going to still make a living? Uh, but it's been very good. I do the commentary. We do all kinds of stuff. I do a bit of acting, podcast, blah 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 blah. But I also opened. Uh, a UFC gym yep. in Costa Mesa because there's a there's a brand UFC gym they're yep. in America they're actually all all over the world. So now. you got your own one in the US. Yeah, well I went into one. Yeah, and it was unbelievable. Yeah, you should have seen the energy and the vibrancy and all the state of the art fitness equipment. Like you hear UFC gym. Yeah, and you think it's for fighters and you know for people getting ready for fights. It's not about that. The fitness gyms. So we open one in Costa Mesa, California, and we've got like two thousand seven hundred members now. The the clientele base is all ladies that are doing yoga and spinning yeah. and stuff like that. But we've got an octagon. We do a jujitsu. We do cardio kickboxing classes. And if you want to go down like more of a fighter's path, you can do that. But that's a very small element of it. Yeah. You know, you go in. You've got all the UFC branding. You've got amazing artwork and pictures the music's pumping a lot of the gyms they have DJs on and whatnot and the, they're, they're, they're packed yeah. they're amazing yeah. I was like this is the coolest gym I've ever seen in my life so um, myself and Cub Swanson he was a UFC fighter we uh, went joints on, on a gym in as I say Costa Mesa that was booming doing well and I was thinking about doing another one and then uh, the U- UFC gym president said Mike you ever thought about the UK market you know because I don't know. I helped build the UK yeah. in terms of MMA. There was lots of other people as well. You know, I'm not saying it's mm. just me. Uh, so I hold that dear to my heart, and I'm a proud ambassador. And I'm proud to represent the UK on the world scene. So I thought, yeah, I think that would do well. So myself and Joe Long, who's over there, and some just other guys. Just a big shout out to Joe Long, by the way. Legend. Yeah, big shout Legend. out to Joe. We've been yeah. mates for years, yeah. and he's, he's, he's helped man. me a lot as well as yeah. being a great friend. Um, so yeah, we. Um, 
Yeah, got a group together. We bought the rights to UFC Gym UK. Yeah. So over the next 10 years, we're committed to opening, I think it's 110 gyms. 110 in the UK? In the UK and Ireland. Yeah, wow. and there'll be, a lot of them will be corporate owned by like, by us. Uh, but there'll also be a lot of franchise opportunities. Okay. Um, so if anyone's interested, by the way, ufcgym.co.uk, you know, if, if, if you fancy getting involved on a franchise level. Uh, so and, you're and looking... Territories are selling out, man. So okay. if, if they are interested... Yeah, so you're looking website. for 100 franchisees not across necessarily the UK over the next 10 probably years? Probably 60, okay. 70, something like that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... So anyone out there listening or watching this on YouTube will go, I actually fancy a piece of this. They'll contact... UFCgym.co.uk. You yeah. UFC, yeah, not not exactly. Yeah. That's what we're doing. As I say, when I walked into a UFC gym, I couldn't believe it. Because, yeah. you know, going to the gym, sometimes, you know, it, it can be a hassle or you can't be arsed. And, yeah. all the, and sometimes some of the gyms, like I have one by my house that I go to, not a UFC gym, yeah. like a regular gym. And fucking hell, it's full of old biddies. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> not every gym's like this. This one, there's a lot of old ladies and gentlemen. Should mm. I shouldn't say biddies. There's this there's one fella. He's got his oxygen mask with him, and you just you don't want to work out there. Yeah. That's one extreme. Yeah. The other extreme is UFC gym. You go in, the music's pumping. It's just cool, man. And you got the mats for jujitsu. You got the rings. You got the octagon. You got massive bag racks. You got every piece of fitness equipment. We got cryotherapy. Brilliant. We got sauna, steam room. We got everything. But it's all just. The UFC is a cool product yeah. and a cool brand and everything about the gyms. It's just cool and it's mm. very, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Very high end. High end. Yeah. And something fresh and new for the UK. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, and you can do everything in there. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's I'm, quality. We're That's excited exciting about project. It. Proper exciting project. What are your thoughts on the next British champ? Who will that be? And also, what are your thoughts on Tom Aspinall? Well, he's going to be the next British champ. Yeah. Tom Aspinall, he's a mate of mine. So maybe I'm a little biased, but uh, I think he's brilliant in every way. You know, it sounds like I've got a crush on him. Uh, he's very charismatic. He's great on the microphone. He's a beautiful human being. He's an amazing man. And inside the ring, he is an absolute monster. Yeah. And in every way. I mean, Saturday night, he just beat Marcin Tybora, yeah. made it look easy. And we just saw the striking. But he's been teaching jiu-jitsu to grown men since he was 16 years old. He's a brilliant wrestler. He's an incredible athlete. He looked like Muhammad Ali on Saturday night. Yeah. Uh, and he's smoked everyone in the UFC so far in the first round. So, yeah, it's only a matter of time. And is it? Is he got a good? Is he got a good management team around him to support him? Because when I look back at your, you coming through the ranks and everything, there wasn't much guidance. It didn't yeah, seem. Yeah, yeah. So you were just you were just winging it, winging it, winging it, finding problems, changing problems, changing direction. Yeah. Someone like him, what advice would you give to him? Yeah, I, I mean, of course, back in the early days, mm. it was it was a bit more of the wild west, yeah. shall we say? So it's definitely got a lot more corporate now. Um, I mean, I, I know Tom and I know his dad, and they're, they're in the process of like trying to sign with an agent right now. And I was recommending my guy, Audiotar from Paradigm Sports sports management because as I said before in the fight game there's a lot of sharks yeah. and it's getting less and less like that now um, as it's more much much more popular but back in the day it was all cronies and gangsters yeah. you know you, you know it was it was a lot of gangsters uh, you have someone honest that's going to work hard that you can trust yeah Trust you know, is key, right? Trust, of man. It is, yeah. Trust, you know. Uh, yeah, so I was recommending him, but yeah, that's, you know, always be careful mm -hmm. to any young fighters out there. Don't sign lengthy contracts. Get it looked at by a lawyer first mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, yeah. Do your homework. So he's the man to watch. Oh, Tom Aspinall's yeah. the man. Tom yeah. Aspinall. Obviously, we've got Leon Edwards. He's a champ as well. Yeah. Who's got a fight against Colby Covington in, in uh, November. But yeah, in terms of next champ, that's going to be Tom Aspinall, yeah. without a shadow of a doubt. And John Jones is the champion, and John Jones is one of the greatest of all time. Uh, Do I you think, think Tom could beat John Jones? I think Tom would smash him to bits. I don't wow. think it would even be a fight. Wow. I'm serious. I, I'm, I, after what I saw Saturday night, I'm watching Ty Boris and John Jones, but I've watched John Jones for years. I don't think no man alive could take on uh, Tom Aspinall. Mm. I don't think so. Mm. I don't think so. And what was it like for you going on the Joe Rogan show? Yeah, I've done it a few times. Uh, yeah, it was great, man. You know, Joe's, that's the biggest platform on the planet. Mm. It really is. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was great. I mean, Joe's been around the UFC forever. He's part of the uh, part of the furniture, you know. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it's always, it's always a pleasure to go down and, uh, you know what I mean? 
Doesn't he? Doesn't he have a contract where if Dana White leaves UFC, he leaves UFC? I, I don't know. I, I, I saw him <laughs> say that. Yeah. I saw him say that. So I'm assuming. I'm assuming yeah. he's not lying. Do you know what I mean? But I, th- I think he just said, "Yeah, if Dana's not around, then he's not interested anymore mm. either." Because D- Dana's, as I said before, you know, not only is he a top man, but he's the visionary. You know, like he, he he's all over everything. The music choices that yeah. you know, every he's little bang on the detail, ball, isn't he? He's yeah. bang on the ball. Yeah. You know, and like you'll see it. Um, you does know, he sleep? I don't think he does. <laughs> sleep. I don't. I don't think he does. In fact, I heard, and I don't, I've never had this conversation with him actually, but I heard that he has this condition where he only sleeps like one or two hours a day, yeah. uh, which probably makes sense for how busy he is and what he does. But um, what was I going to say? But yeah, yeah. Anyway, Go on, say, do you think steroids is rife in the UFC? Not in the UFC. Uh, well, 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 I don't know. See, we have. USADA now. Yeah. We never used to have that, which is the United States Anti-Doping Association. If you sign up to UFC, you have to sign up to the USADA program and you get randomly tested. They show up at five o'clock in the morning, which is a proper pain in the ass because if, even if you're not fighting, they're still testing yeah. you and you might have had a few beers last night and they're knocking you up at five o'clock in the fucking morning. It's like, fuck off. <laughs> what do you want? Come back at do 10. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, Come back yeah. at a normal hour. Uh, yeah, they'll take take your piss and your blood. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's very very hard but you never know because as long as there's sports and as long as there's money there's always people trying to cheat and find a way mm. back in the day it was steroid city yeah. I've never touched one in my life yeah. uh, they they used to do a test on the night yeah. only the main event as well so basically um, what I know now because I was very naive mm. to it all back then Basically, it's just an IQ test. Yeah. You know, you, you can you, you can find ways to mask that and get it out of your system in time and all the rest of it. So now, uh, people still test positive. People people still get caught. So there's still people doing it. Yeah. Um, and is it, what's it, what's it, it a month? Caught. Isn't it a month can come out your system? I don't. It, I, I, I don't even know. I, I don't yeah. know. I don't know all the details. Honestly, I think there's some stuff that might come out in like nine hours. Yeah. Do you, do you know what I mean? yeah. so, so I, I, I honestly don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's not my area of expertise. What percent do you reckon someone would get if they did take Roy's going into a fight? Listen, here's, here's what steroids do for you. Mm. When I'm training for a fight, I'm out of bed Monday morning, 5.30 a.m., I'm going for a run. 10 o'clock, I'm down at the gym. I'm doing two hours hard work. I'm sparring. I'm doing whatever. In the evening, I'm doing strength and conditioning. I'm doing my squats. I'm doing my sprints. That's, and then that's, you know, it's something like that. Different sessions, different days, whatever. Saturday mornings, you're always doing sprints. You run every day. You're doing about 30 training sessions a week, right? By Wednesday, I'm knackered, yeah. right? My body is killing head to toe. I can hardly even walk down mm. the stairs, right? Steroids allow you to recover quicker. Yeah. So, so by the end of the week, I'm like, oh, oh, because I'm sore and I yeah. need the rest and the, I need a recovery and I need a sauna and all the rest of it. If you're on steroids, you're recovering overnight. You're still smashing it big time yeah. in the gym. Do you know what I mean? So you can, your body goes to a higher level. You know what I mean? You can mm. make more gains because you're recovering and you're able to push yourself more. Yeah. So yeah, and yeah. It, of course they make you stronger and all the rest yeah, of it. Yeah. But uh, but but that that's the main advantage. Mm. Yeah. And tell me about Bisping the movie. Oh yeah, yeah. How yeah. cool is that having a movie? Listen, this whole story, this whole story's made. It's like a proper rocket yeah, story. Like, yeah, yeah. How on earth did that come about? I just got approached by a Canadian company. They they had a budget to do it. They said we want to do a documentary about your life. I asked, yeah, go on then. You know, they're going to pay me a few quid. So I'm like, I'll do anything for a pound now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, go on then. How much are you going to pay me? Sweet, done. What uh, did they pay you? Not that much, but it's the biggest documentary. Universal have ever done, so I'm still waiting for all my residuals. So we'll see. Happy days, yeah, man. yeah. So hopefully, hopefully, by the end, it, it'll do all right. Um, but it, we, we had a lot of star power on that. We had Vin Diesel talking Absolutely. about me, we had Mickey Rourke, we had, we had Scott Adkins, we, we, you know, obviously a ton of people in the UFC, mm. Dana White, and whatever, loads of people like that. But um, yeah, it was good. And then now, this sounds like a proper knobhead thing to say, <laughs> I've, got, I've got a few, um. Hollywood producers that are very accredited and they're, they're trying to do like the motion picture yeah. of my life now and they're actually trying to attach some some big name actors Man, so, this is quality so yeah 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 I hope it happens yeah yeah, do you know yeah. What this I mean? is quality so but probably won't you know what I mean Hollywood they yeah. are full of shit yeah so we'll see yeah 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 before we wrap up have you got anything to say to your beautiful wife and kids 
Oh, oh, of course. I mean, they're, they're my they're my everything. They're, they're what I do this for. That's why I push myself to the limit. That's why I risk my health, and I have risked my health. Yeah. I've got a broken back in two areas. I'm blind in one eye. I've got two total knee replacements. I need surgery on my fucking wrist. There, I can't breathe through my nose. I had to take my ribs and rebuild my nose. My shoulder is fucking agony. I'm in pain. 24 7 365 do you know what i mean i have headaches every day like crazy but i have no regrets whatsoever because i have built an amazing life for them and my children uh you know my son's at college in san francisco my daughter's going to drama school and she rides fucking horses you know what i mean people always say do you want to fight do you want your kids to fight i'm like well i grew up scrapping on the streets of fucking clitheron manchester yeah. every day they grew up in california with the swimming pool <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know what i mean like like you know the motivation might not be the same not that they couldn't do that uh, and to my wife I'm just so grateful they say behind every great man yeah, there's a great yeah. woman but uh, it's it's then some and not just that not just supporting me in the fight just putting up with me because yeah. I've been an emotional idiot I've always had a bad temper and all the rest of it and I'm getting a lot better as I'm older um you know, and she's helped me. She's trained me like that. She's very calm. She's very patient. Yeah. She understands me. She she loves me for who I am. Uh, and if it weren't for her, I wouldn't be here. And I love yeah. her more than life itself. Massive respect, Mike. I've absolutely loved this. Oh well, thank you very much. You, Cheers, Dodge. Mate, this is quality. I've loved it as well. It's been yeah, fun. This is quality, mate. I really nice. thank you for your time. I look forward to having a few beers tonight. Mama, absolutely. Let's do it. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> Cheers, Good fella. Man.